actual architecture company integrates design research, speculative design practice, and a commitment to building architecture that enhances culture and community. Day founded the actual architecture company after 15 years practicing as a founding principal of Men Day in San Francisco and Omaha. It is my honor to introduce Jeffrey Day. Thank you very much, Diana. I'm really excited to be uh, sharing uh, some work with you guys today. Um, I wish I could be with you in person, um, but uh, there we are. Um, I'm gonna just get my screen going here and, and jump right in. Um, okay, just to make sure you should be seeing my, my logos here for actual architecture company. In fact, uh, as Diana mentioned, um, uh, I, I operate between the academic and the professional world. Um, and the two practices that I organize here, arch actual architecture and fact, operate very closely together, often collaborating on projects in various different phases. Um, and sometimes uh, operating separately, but they allow us to work uh, in, a, in a wide range of different capacities uh, and looking at some very different and interesting projects. Uh, so the talk today is titled Witchcraft, that is spelled correctly. Um, and I, I wanna focus on an issue that uh, is sort of a framework for, uh, within which we look at our practice that deals with issues of, of craft and a unique relationship of craft to architecture and architectural practice. At some point uh, in the design of, of every project, a designer needs to ask herself, which form of craft does this project demand? How do we make these decisions? Are we in control or are we ruled by external forces such as economy, risk, available technology, building standards, or broader cultural forces. And in this talk, I'm gonna contemplate these questions through a variety of projects from actual architecture and also from the design build studio fact. The, the word craftsman, uh, and I'm using the gendered term because that is uh, you know, still uh, in, in many ways common, um, uh, usually conjures a stereotypical image of an old man in a workshop making things with manual tools. And as the sociologist Richard Sennett writes, craftsmanship is the skill of making things well. And a craftsperson or a craftsman uh, is anyone dedicated to good work for its own sake. So while practical, craftsmanship is not simply a means to an end. And craftsmanship is not limited to work with hand tools. One can embody craftsmanship in a variety of fields and through a range of technologies. Senate talks at length about open source computer programming and in particular the uh, Linux uh, operating system as a subfield in which programmers work for the desire to make elegant code, not necessarily uh, for a remuneration. In this context, quality is dependent on an effective community of software engineers and coders working together with the shared goal of bettering the software itself. The combined notion here of craft and community is critical, and it's something that I'm going to return to at the end with the last couple of projects in the talk. In all eras, craftsmanship implies a particular relationship between the craftsperson and the tool, selecting the right tool for the job. This is more often an ad hoc pragmatic exercise than an attempt at, at procedural purity, as craftsmanship focuses on the thing itself, not the tool or the procedure. The thing made is its own justification. Richard Sennett defines craftsmanship as the basic human impulse to do a job well for its own sake, and thus we usually associate good craft with custom products and a high degree of refinement. What may be understood as good quality varies though uh, with the context of, of the project itself. This is an early project uh, from my previous friend, Min Day. Uh, it's in Northern Iowa on a lake, uh, and it's a project that uh, exhibits an attempt by us as the architects to exercise a precise level and a high level of control uh, on uh, every aspect of this project from structure to exterior cladding, landscape, uh, and interior surfaces, um, colors, and, and products, and, and so on. But to achieve such controlled precision in contemporary architectural practice takes a lot of architectural attention specifically exhaustive detailing and documentation. Uh, in pre-modern architecture, a social relationship existed between a master builder and a craftsperson, and that obviated the need for documentation. The builder relied in that case on tacit knowledge of the given building medium. 
Uh, nowadays, documentation is required not only to achieve quality and control, but because of obviously legal constraints and, and new, more complex relationships between builders, designers, and clients. So for this particular project, we had four books of, of architectural details uh, associated with the, the rest of the architectural drawing set um, in order to achieve everything that we uh, wanted to do within, within the project itself. So again, what may be understood as good quality varies with the context of the project. Finely crafted, but not necessarily fine materials. A contrast of material quality, high, low, uh, refined, and rough. Here in this house, the fine craftsmanship of uh, cabinetry making and furniture making is applied to materials such as oriented strand board, not normally associated with high quality, to create a form of visual tension. Here, precise controls uh, uh, create uh, in, intentional material contradictions. And this is something that we refer to as a controlled imprecision, where we're controlling the roughness and the, and the looseness of the project. Again, uh, still within the same project, a head, custom headboard uh, created with uh, computer animation tools, translated into digital fabrication software and, and produced on a, a CNC milling machine. Uh, the headboard here is a supple sort of representation of the surface of, of the lake, um, but crafted out of, of plywood that is allowed to be exposed so that we understand the making of the uh, of the piece out of uh, layered two-dimensional material. So if fine craft is a choice, then what are the alternatives? And this brings me to something that's become an interest of ours, but uh, looking at paradigms of craft through uh, the field of manufacturing quality control. So examples here include custom craft, uh, something that we're quite familiar with here, which focuses on product specifications relative to consumer demands and paradigms of manufacturing including mass, mass production, mass customization, and emerging fields of personalization. The technocraft paradigm emulates custom craft, but is less expensive by the integration of computation into the manufacturing process. And this is particularly vi visible in the apparel industry these days where somebody can have uh, a custom shoe made uh, to you know, a precise sh shape and size and material texture uh, without necessarily spending a tremendous amount more uh, money than one would for a mass-produced shoe. So um, despite uh, this sort of experimentation with algorithmic design and digital fabrication, the building industry and architecture is still generally rather traditional in its emphasis on customization, which often means uh, handmade products, products built outside of the normal procurement process for uh, building materials. So I, I first became aware of the importance of different craft paradigms uh, in college when I occupied myself with set design and technical direction in college theatrical productions. Um, and here, the resolution, the visual resolution that is of stage details from the position of the audience, an audience member may be 50 feet or even 100 feet away from the stage. This depends on a degree of imprecision in the construction and detailing of the scenery. Set painting needs to be exaggerated and rougher and somewhat crude on a close appearance in order to look correct to an audience who is sitting at the distance uh, of, of the seat in, in, in the house. The expectations of stagecraft then are very different from custom craft uh, as seen in fine cabinetry and, and woodworking, furniture making, and so on. These different paradigms of craft come from very different expectations and definitions of quality, correctness, tolerance, and so on. Each paradigm has its own set of expectations and marks of quality. Here, the Eames House uh, in Pacific Palisades in Los Angeles is visibly an assembled kit of parts where joints and fasteners are clearly articulated and parts are always autonomous from one another. What we call farm craft exhibits expedience, pragmatism, but not necessarily aesthetic coherence. Here, there's a question of resolution and appropriate fitness to the task at hand uh, and not to cultural issues or uh, visual issues. It's a, it's, a, it's a matter of getting something done to serve a purpose. But in architecture, uh, our field occupies an interesting position in this discourse. We have a kind of craftsmanship that defines how we work, our techniques in the, in the design office, but we also engage other craftspeople to realize our creations. 
we must therefore select the category of craftsmanship that is not only appropriate to the practical task at hand, but also matched to our cultural expectations as represented in the project. And ideally, we see the implement, implementers of our work, the builders and the makers, as collaborators and not competitors. The architectural historian Robin Evans writes that architects don't make buildings, they make drawings for buildings, and now maybe computer models for buildings. But with computational tools, the possibility of enacting a direct connection between the design process or design craft and the building process is potentially achievable. Like technocraft in the field of manufacturing quality control, there is an attempt here to merge the customization of traditional craft with the efficiency of mass production. However, a lack of coherence between the design craft in the office and the building craft on the site can lead to unsatisfactory results. Richard Sennett refers to this as a conflict existing between getting something right and getting it done. Here uh, in this article from Art Forum magazine on uh, Zaha Hadid's Guangzhou Opera House, uh, we see advanced digital design techniques but a lack of understanding of the real context of implementation, uh, where at this point of, in, in the history of the development of construction in China, speed of construction methods used, commitment of clients did not always match the goals of the architect. So a disconnect between a design and its realization can, can occur. Often the sophistication at one end of the process must accommodate a lack of sophistication at the other end of the process. And this may require a hybrid technique. Rem Kulhas recognized this in early work of OMA, uh, particularly in, in Europe, where they understood their lack of control of the construction site and knowingly took advantage of this or maybe post-rationalized it to, uh, to create a, a conceptual approach to roughness, looseness, and uh, lack of coherence. But architects have long attempted critical experiments with available craft. Le Corbusier, in his interest in the tension of concrete behaving as it shouldn't, as a pure form, but still a rough material. Or Renzo Piano here, both buildings um, at, at Harvard University. Renzo Piano's play on mechanical craft, uh, emphasizing the direct assembly of parts, but often deceptively refined to the point where the individual parts are no longer performing as they appear to be doing so. In, in the project itself. They become representations of structure, not necessarily structure. So I'm going to show a variety of projects at, a, at a various scales and try to articulate um, their particular relationship to craft and how this has sort of evolved our thinking about these issues as we've evolved as practitioners. Uh, and this first project illustrates the idea of the conflict between getting something right and getting it done. So in Advanced sort of digital manufacturing, there's a notion of mass customization, the idea that something can be infinitely variable within a project, but achievable at a, at, a, at a moderate cost due to the connection between the computational design process and digital fabrication. So for this project, which is an interior uh, design project, part of a, a three bedroom or three room project within a, a residence in San Francisco, uh, we created a desk that can transform into a bed one way or the other way uh, and imagine this as a sort of perforated uh, panel, a wood panel series of, of components put together uh, in on the site but fabricated off-site uh, and initially imagined it sort of infinite variability of, of these hole sizes, holes that cut through, holes that uh, only penetrate a certain depth of the material of varying diameters from very small, say a quarter of an inch up to about an inch and a half or two inches, but with infinite variability. We developed a, a computer model for this in, um, in an early version of Grasshopper. Um, but when we started to work with the fabricators, we realized that since we're paying for machine time, the routing process to create the infinite hole variability, although achievable, starts to cost quite a lot of money when you're spending $120 an hour for a machine. So instead, we changed the, the model to optimize this, this uh, pattern set that we created uh, to work with only five different diameters. And those five diameters could be cut with discrete sized drill bits instead of routing materials, uh, routing uh, end mills. 
Uh, and this allowed for a much faster, almost 80% faster uh, production time. So the design process, which began with this sort of uh, almost gestural sort of sketching uh, on the computer, produced uh, what ended up being a fairly straightforward fabrication system uh, of these sort of five diameters mapped onto this surface. And so when uh, the sort of ideal of the design meets the realities of fabrication, sometimes the pragmatics of making start to push back against the design process and cause what might be seen as compromises, but in the end, uh, change the work into something new and, and potentially more interesting. Um, furniture craft, uh, something that we've uh, engaged in in the design of custom furniture, but also in, in projects such as this uh, house in Chicago. Um, we did design uh, many custom furniture pieces for this, such as this table we call the 345 table, uh, made out of um, uh, oak veneer, uh, and then using the same white oak for the rest of the building, where the level of detail of furniture craftsmanship uh, sort of translates into architectural elements uh, in the millwork throughout this large house, including interior and exterior spaces. So we're applying the craft of the furniture maker to the making of architecture and working very closely with craftspeople from uh, the mill workers in the shop who produced all the woodwork uh, in, in a controlled environment of their own studio. Uh, and then the plasterers, in this case, in the field who merged that material into the site, creating these very uh, challenging uh, sort of zero edges. And then within, this was an existing house, of course, that we were uh, remodeling, uh, not new construction. So we're dealing with things such as an existing fireplace that we couldn't move, uh, but building around that to create uh, interesting and unique opportunities and surprising moments within the house where a desk emerges out of a bedroom wall. And then the same level of detailing translates from interior to exterior with a change of wood, but the appearance maintains uh, consistency from inside to outside. Excuse me, let me go back to that one. Um, and you can see uh, the level of detail changes somewhat as one gets to the exterior because we're dealing with climate as opposed to a controlled environment of the interior. Um, but the appearance of the project is, is consistent in, in some fashions. So the fabrication and construction team, as I mentioned uh, before, and, and Diana noted in the introduction, is a design build program that I run at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And we've uh, worked on a variety of projects from interior remodels to furniture to new buildings and in some cases some larger projects that uh, where we're working with other architects uh, to do the, the primary uh, core and shell work. So it operates in many ways like a nonprofit architectural firm based within the university. Um, and construction and um, Design build here is seen as an opportunity for students to gain experience in the contingencies of real world practice. They aren't necessarily building everything that we design. Uh, and I noticed that uh, Emily McGlone is going to be your next speaker. Um, I, I've known Emily for a while. And she's very much engaged in design build, but in, in a different fashion where um, the, the issue of learning by making is much more critical uh, in her practice. So I, I think you could maybe see some differences in the way we approach these things. So the Bema Center for Contemporary Art was actually the first uh, project that the FACT program took on. Uh, and we've been working with Bemis for about 18 years, off and on, on a variety of different projects. Bemis is an artist in residency program in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, with a mission to support artists through exhibition space and uh, workspace. Uh, artists come here for uh, three month or two month residencies uh, and sometimes have the opportunity to exhibit their work, but the exhibit program uh, includes artists from other uh, other areas as well who are not necessarily residents. The goal of the Bemis here is to close the gap between spaces of production and the making of art and the spaces of, the con of consumption of art, bringing audiences and the makers together. At the Bemis, artists use the building itself as uh, a work site, quite literally, making artworks that engage the building and its environment. In this case, the, the Rainbow Project curated by Tessie McGraw uh, and, and realized by Michael Jones McKean uh, created a rainbow from uh, salvaged uh, rainwater uh, around the building uh, to sort of highlight issues of water use in the state, an agricultural state, of course. We began um, with the Bemis as a, uh, doing a master plan. We went through several phases of this with different groups of students, 
looking at indoor spaces, workspaces for artists, galleries for the public, uh, facilities for art making, uh, such as the sculpture studio, and organize this uh, as part of a continuous landscape, uh, indoor and outdoor spaces being conceived as a continuity of surfaces. Uh, realized projects include the garden space, um, the uh, artists' uh, studios on the third floor. Previously, they'd only used the second floor for art residency. We built out the third floor with a number of studios and installation spaces. Uh, we reworked the entire first floor gallery sequence to open spaces up for more circulation uh, to allow for uh, different uh, types of shows and audience experiences within the space, including video art and performance. Um, and then most recently, we've been working on a sound art and experimental music uh, facility. Uh, the Bemis has expanded beyond visual arts to support art, artists working in sound and music. Uh, and we created a unique facility for performances, but also a recording studio uh, and back of house spaces for the artists. This project is in, I'll be showing a few slides of this in a moment, but this project is still in, in construction um, in various phases. The first phase is complete. The first built piece at the BEMA Center is actually uh, a, an image here, um, as you can see, of uh, an undulating uh, surface within uh, a performance area and lecture space. It is essentially designed to convert a white cube gallery into a space uh, more conducive to live performance. Uh, so one of our goals here is to create an acoustical baffle. And I should mention that this project, uh, from the date of commission, to the date of completion, uh, we only had about six weeks to, to achieve the work. So it was designed very quickly, probably in two days. Uh, and then the surfaces were, were optimized for uh, fabrication using very inexpensive materials, CDX plywood and, and homosote. Um, the budget for this particular part, there were some other components to the project, but for this piece is about $1,500. Um, and it was built by my office, um, interns in the office and, um, uh, we did this as a pro bono project, so we weren't getting paid fees. The, the, the money went to uh, materials uh, only here. So um, as you can see, the sort of roughness of the plywood sort of comes together here in a, in a, to produce a more continuous, smooth, appear, uh, apparently smooth surface, uh, simply by the integration of the geometries of uh, fabrication. Um, the curvature of the wall is, is uh, contradicted by the arrangement of the horizontal homosote slats so that when one looks at the wall straight on, it appears quite flat. Um, but then from various angles, uh, one can start to see the accentuated uh, double curvature of the surface resolving itself in a bench so that during performances, audience members can sit at the base. And so this piece, uh, it was built originally to be um, a temporary installation that would be removed in sort of four foot sections and stored. Um, but the Bemis has decided that uh, given the popularity of its use, that they, they kept it as a permanent uh, piece. It's now 12 years old and still uh, being used uh, quite actively. Um, but this is sort of part of a transformation of the art gallery into a place of social engagement. We see the art center here as a, a kind of social condenser, bringing together uh, the artists, the audiences, and um, the, the, the staff. Uh, into a, a kind of continuous uh, environment of, of engagement around artwork, not simply a passive uh, place to consume visual arts. So uh, the next part of this um, pr project included the what we call the Bemis Info Shop, which is, um, you know, in basic terms, it's the reception area and lobby for the galleries that uh, curiously didn't exist before. Um, prior to our project, the uh, audio, uh, you know visitors would enter through the the front door opposite the steps here, and they would be directly inside a gallery space. Um, it was a very sort of rough and uh, and rudimentary kind of art center, um, but in order to sort of en enhance programming and audience and, uh, member engagement, we built this um, reception area we, by taking away the first bay of, of a gallery and creating a space that's not really for art but more for public engagement calling it an info shop because there would be in, uh, information available books and in pamphlets uh, for, for members and, and uh, designed in conjunction with an outdoor garden that was built a few years later uh, by students 
um, as a place that casually could be engaged by uh, members of the public without necessarily having to go into the gallery spaces. Um, so we designed this as a kind of abstraction of the white cube gallery into a, an artwork itself, uh, something that could be inhabited, um, but not a place for display or, or performance. We, we began the project by uh, with an interest in um, aperiodic tiling patterns, and this is a pin, what's called a pinwheel aperiodic tiling pattern. It's um, aperiodic because you, one cannot simply sort of um, translate one section of pattern to an adjacent surface and make a continuous uh, flow of pattern. It, it varies constantly. It's created by a, th a three, four, five right triangle um, with um, five triangles uh, you know, within each other. So uh, it can operate as a fractal pattern, infinitely scalable. As you can kind of see the pattern sort of increasing its depth. So within this sort of abstraction of the pattern, we selected an area that we would translate into the three-dimensional space of the gallery. And then to translate this infinite um, fractal quality into a definitive, um, ultimately three-dimensionally fabricated component, um, we produced an algorithm that generated a surface uh, articulation around the various important nodes. So the scaling of the pattern happens uh, at, in the sort of uh, vicinity of these center points within the surface. Ultimately, uh, the piece is made out of uh, 3D, uh, or three axis routed uh, MDF uh, in panels, um, optimized for four by eight sheets. So we're, we're not wasting any material. The triangle is cut directly out of a four by eight sheet. Uh, the, so the bigger joints that you see here are between panels. The second and third level of grooves are just routed get, uh, to different depths within the panel. And then the smaller triangles are pocketed in the surface of, of the MDF. This is then extra, uh, sort of extruded into three dimensions uh, and uh, wa a wrapped or sort of bent into the space. And then the desk is a, an extrapolation of that pattern into a fully three dimensional object. So when you look at the desk straight on from a seated position, you would see one of these major vertices cutting through the desk and then replicating itself on the wall behind. Uh, so the big bends in the wall are actually part of much larger triangular fo forms that were much bigger than the space itself. So a high degree of precision in this project required quite a lot of translation between uh, the precision of the, the CNC routed material, which offer, you know, the router can operate at a thousandth of an inch tolerance to a building uh, from the 19th century where, you know, if the floor might vary two inches between uh, column lines on 16 inches, uh, 16 foot centers. So there's quite a lot of uh, roughness to the building. And to accommodate that, we had to build our own framing elements to translate this surface into this space and then allow a significant reveal around the form in order to uh, allow for uh, the variations to occur. So uh, with the design build program, um, as I noted, I'm, I'm not particularly interested in having the students do all of the work, but I want them to know how the work is done and to engage with fabricators outside of the studio when necessary. With this project, we realized we had to route 35 sheets of MDF. That would have taken virtually a whole semester of students operating in our shop. So. Uh, we started looking around for a partner outside who could do the, the major production after the students made uh, the initial mock-ups. And we went to a local state prison. I'm not allowed to show images of prisoners, so I'm letting these guys stand in for our collaborators at a, uh, the Lincoln Correctional Center, which is a medium security state prison in Lincoln, Nebraska. They happen to have that nice router I showed on the previous image. Um, so the, the students did all the coding uh, for the machine operation, uh, translated those files to the shop in the prison. Inmates produce the work. They, they work within a, a workplace development program, uh, learning skills that uh, when they eventually get out of prison, they would may be able to use in the, in the workplace, uh, and in a cabinet shop, for example. Um, and then those, those panels were delivered to the site in Omaha, and the students did the installation. Um, but one of the things that we were interested in here is this collision between the precision of these ball panels and the existing building, allowing things to overlap awkwardly in order to highlight those differences in both era and production method. 
as part of making this wall, I noted the previously the the, the need to translate the building or the construction to uh, this existing building. And we we built uh, custom made studs out of CNC routed plywood to control the surface geometry, and then custom gussets to connect more traditional framing uh, into the geometry needed between the the control ends. Those then were built within the space using laser sights and some very basic means to control the surfaces. And then the panels um, were built or were installed on top of uh, a substrate, um, allowing a little bit of slop within the, the quarter inch gap between the panels themselves. And here you can see the, the design of the garden evolved out of the same ge geometry. Uh, and that was built two years later with students uh, from landscape architecture and architecture in a, a, a separate fact class. So the current project here, Bemis Low End, in um, the uh, the underground or the basement of, of the Bemis Center for Contemporary Arts supports the new sound art and experimental music program. And here we're really interested in exploring the boundaries of conventional architectural taste and expectations of precision uh, uh, and rat with, you know, in ultimately radical juxtapositions of, of different craft standards operating within the same space. So reading uh, David Pye, a craft theorist and woodworker, um, Pye talks about the workmanship of certainty, which involves precision, control, mass production. And this is something that we're familiar with in the architecture and, and contemporary building practice, where the goal of material specifications and installation is uh, precision and tolerance uh, within you know, understood limits and reduced risk. And to this, David Pye contrasts the workmanship of risk, something that might be more associated with traditional craft, where handiwork uh, cannot always be predetermined, and the result um, uh, of subsequent iterations of an object uh, made by hand might be somewhat different. They won't be exactly the same repetitions, uh, will always have variability. And so we uh, were interested in trying to think of these two ways of conceiving of craft at the same time. So fact always works with large scale models as a design process. This is an image of half inch to the foot scale model for this space, which allows us to get into a high level of detail and actually start to build things the way we imagine they might be built as a way to sort of enact a, a, a construction process in the studio. Uh, we also do one to one mockups and create um, uh, test pieces uh, as we work. So this project involves um, students working on uh, some aspects of the project, but we also collaborated uh, with an artist and carpenter who worked closely with students and did some of the uh, some of the work as well. Some things were cut on a CNC router in, in a controlled fashion. Other things were cut uh, very roughly and on site, uh, such as the, these elements here, where precision was maybe uh, of less interest than uh, trying to create an, an effect. This We call this the curtain wall. It's a uh, it's a, an undulating wall that creates an acoustical baffle around this sort of rough basement. The ceiling height here is only about eight, in a, eight feet, four inches. So uh, it's a pretty challenging space for a performance venue. Um, so the idea with the stage in, in this space was to try to highlight the artist and performer as much as possible. Now, of course, this could be a single uh, singer songwriter performing here. It could be an experimental musician working with pre-recorded uh, computer sound, uh, or it could be a large-scale band or ensemble, or it could occupy the entire room. But the, the focal point here of the stage became an important way to, to highlight uh, the artist within a space where uh, they might be mingling with a, an audience. Uh, we decided to work with, um, and this is something one of the students uh, conceived, uh, uh, this idea of an anamorphic perspective where one, in, you know, from one particular point in the room, the uh, stage appears as a circle, sort of a halo around the artist. Um, but then as one moves around the space, the, that uh, apparent circle starts to distend and turn into a much more uh, oblong shape, which uh, accommodates the size of the, of the performing group. Um, and here we're dealing with the workmanship of certainty. This was designed uh, with uh, in Rhino with a you know, computer model translated into the space with uh, laser sights uh, fabricated off site and then installed uh, on site in, in components that clip together in a 
in a fairly precise way, uh, despite the uh, looseness and roughness of the space. But in contrast to that is a, an element we call the monolith. This um, began as a solution to deal with an existing mechanical room right in the very center of the performance space, the not at all ideal situation for uh, a performing art space. But uh, we took this in stride and came up with a solution that involved wrapping the monolith with, or this sort of enclosed uh, mechanical room with upholstery and acoustical plaster as a way of both muffling the uh, sound of the uh, material itself, or the, the equipment inside um, with the materials here, but also using this as a sound absorptive uh, element within the space to deal with reverberations from uh, performances. So the, uh, uh, the contrast here really occurs between the, the fabrication of this as uh, a, a plywood structure essentially added to the, the mechanical room uh, from uh, an algorithmic model that generated this pattern of varying sizes that work acoustically to, to uh, baffle various uh, you know, frequencies of sound, um, but then um, shot with an air gun and using you know, acoustical plaster to build up this surface to an extreme level of, of roughness and um, almost cave-like quality, and then painting it pink. So uh, this interest in the, the relationship between uh, design control and the roughness and looseness of the ultimate artifact is something that we've experimented again uh, in, in other projects. But here, uh, this piece called Flock is actually now installed as part of the uh, of the low end performance space. It'll be part of the pre event bar in, in phase two, uh, seen here through the performing uh, performance space window. Um, but Flock itself is a construction of uh, post tensioned uh, wood using cables as as tensioning members. It began its life as a design for a multi faith chapel at Santa Clara University in California, uh, where we were working within. Uh, an historic building. We could not touch the surfaces of the building. We couldn't attach anything to the building. It had to be entirely freestanding construction uh, to create the interior of this chapel. And so here, dealing with um, uh, a kind of controlled imprecision again, um, but with a social component where we, we wanted the students uh, at the university to actually do the assembly of this project. So assembly had to be a very straightforward process and something that could be ritualized and experienced by any student on the campus without any experience or skill. Um, and so this required a fairly high sophistication in the design end of the project. We uh, again conceived this as a freestanding um, post-tensioned uh, cable structure using a, a steel member at the base that would simply sit on the existing floor, uh, a, a tension plate at the top, uh, and then a series of uh, airplane cables stretched between that. Uh, around those cables would be stacked members of standard framing lumber cut to size. Um, and by varying the sizes and using an algorithm that started to help these elements sort of stack in place, we could create, um, as you can see in this image, the translation from a, a rectangle at the floor to an ellipse uh, at, the, at the top of the piece. This project was canceled uh, due to the changing priorities at the university for their buildings. Uh, in fact, they actually decided to build a new building uh, for the multi-faith chapel. Um, but we were very interested in this project and chose to continue uh, with the research um, in the uh, context of an art exhibition. Uh, we were invited to do an installation in a gallery and chose to build this as a three-dimensional inhabitable structure. Uh, for a, a two-month uh, run at a gallery. And as, as I mentioned, it's now permanently installed at the Bema Center. Um, and so here we, we worked within the geometry of this small gallery, uh, which allowed us to build a 10-foot by 10-foot cube. Um, we thought of this, the same sort of translation geometrically as translation of the 10-foot square to the 7-foot diameter circle. Uh, stretching between that, uh, the ruled surfaces, which became the cables, and then twisting uh, the cable uh, between the two, uh, the top and the bottom end edges um, to introduce uh, a tension in the, both the cables and also a, a visual tension as the piece appears to be in motion, uh, turning the corner. Uh, the entrance to the space is simply just a gap between cables. Uh, and so when the wood members are stacked, uh, people could walk inside and inhabit the interior of, of this construction. 
So in terms of tolerance and precision, uh, in order to build a very precise uh, translation of surfaces uh, in this piece, uh, one would require a high number of, of different element sizes so that the increments between each element would, would uh, be very subtle. Um, but for, for uh, ease of fabrication and simplicity of installation, uh, we, we tried to reduce that to as uh, low a number as we could and settled on 10 different sizes. Uh, and then each one of those sizes has an alternate with what we call a twig, a sort of extension that would project into the interior. Um, using this as an image of our grasshopper model, um, where uh, we can control for board length, um, board quantity, and a uh, number of different types. So we settled on, on as I mentioned, the 10, um, and then output all of the components for this uh, for very simple uh, fabrication in the shop from uh, two by six lumber. Um, there are 72 layers, about 2,500 to 3,000 parts. I can't remember the exact number. And simply by following these maps and stacking the pieces in the precise position, um, as you can see, the form starts to trans, trans I guess, translate the square to the circle um, with uh, the gradual changing of the, of the sizes of the elements. To build this, uh, we uh, have to install the steel members first, but the cables are, are loose, so they, they, there's no way for the, the upper ring to support itself. So we built a version of a, a Renaissance false work uh, used for centering arches and domes as a kind of scaffold to support the upper ring. Um, while we stack the, the wood members on slightly tensioned uh, cables, uh, once the wood members are all installed, the scaffold is unbolted and removed through the gap, uh, and then the cables are tensioned ultimately to hold this in uh, sort of its permanent position. I'm gonna show a, a brief video, and I'll probably skip through this a little bit, that gives some sense of how this is done. This is the scaffold being built here, uh, and then installing the cables on the upper ring. Um, there are 37 cables. It's just a, simply a matter of getting them in the right holes. Uh, and then stacking the wood members. Each of the wood members has two slots cut in the ends that allow it to slip over the cable, but once the others are in there, they can't come out, so there's no way to move them out. But what's really fascinating about this piece is the apparent uh, looseness of it, uh, contrasting with the very precise geometries, ultimately, uh, as one moves up to the top of the piece and then uh, to the interior. And here's just a, a quick view of sort of moving around the interior. And you can see those twigs are the elements that are projecting to the inside. And those increase in number and frequency as one reaches the top. Uh, as you can see here, what's really interesting, I think, is that these pieces are loose enough that you can grab onto one and jiggle it. Um, but the overall piece as a structure is very sound and, and stable. Uh, and tensioning of the cables, uh, of, you know, they can be periodically tensioned. We tried to introduce uh, uh, springs to keep them in tension, but chose to just allow occasional adjustment. Uh, ultimately, the wood shrank to a sort of stable position and didn't need to be touched anymore. So now jumping to a much larger scale, we've, uh, I'm going to show two projects that address some of these issues of craft at a much greater uh, scale of, of building. This is a project that's currently in, in the works and fundraising right now, a collaboration with So Ill, and uh, here. Uh, we're working on um, a community-based uh, art residency program. This is a, for a rental studios for artists and, and apartments, um, working with a local art center and nonprofit developer. Uh, this is within a uh, under-resourced under, uh, uh, African-American neighborhood in, in the north part of Omaha. Um, we were funded by an NEA grant, so this allowed us to create a series of, of workshops for uh, stakeholders and community members to really understand how this project could both support the community and the artists who would be working there. Uh, we think of it as a gradient of indoor and outdoor spaces, existing built historic buildings and, and new construction in contrast to those, um, and also a, a diffuseness of, of the building between interior and exterior spaces. So at the ground floor, uh, we've got uh, the two new buildings here in the center, a historic building to the left of one of these, which is uh, uh, a, a jazz venue, the art center on the on the left side here, 
uh, and then a future um, rehab of a Great Plains Black History Museum would, would, would join as a future phase. As one moves up through the building, we start to see the different uh, types of spaces inhabited uh, within this sort of consistent 10-foot uh, grid. This building is optimized for cross-laminated timber construction, so each bay is based on the maximum dimension of, of the CLT panel. And then kind of moving up to the top, um, after the stakeholder meetings, we chose to contrast uh, the different levels. So one level would be apartments, the next level would be studios, and then reverting to apartments and studios. Um, so the, the uh, artists ultimately decided they wanted their workspaces separated from their dwelling space. And so that uh, sort of in inspired us to kind of separate these into uh, floor levels. So here we see the sort of basic uh, concept of the CLT rigid structure for floor plates and shear walls, and then an exoskeleton of, um, uh, these are glue lamb beams made out of, of white oak, uh, which uh, can be installed outside. Um, and then between the exoskeleton and the building envelope, we have a, a metal deck here for the artists, and then a mesh uh, screen that creates this diaphanous surface for the building, diffusing light, but also creating a sense of semi-privacy for the artists on their uh, personal deck spaces. And then the public realm operating both between at the, the ground level and on the roof of the uh, historic building. Um, it's an open space for community engagement, um, but also a space for the making of art and the display of art, but at a more commercial scale than the, than the Bema Center. This is meant to be uh, permanent residences for, for artists as opposed to temporary residencies uh, such as Bema's. Um, the private workspaces would be optimized for light and, and different uh, procedures that the artist would be engaging with. Uh, and then the public space to create a sense of community uh, within the neighborhood um, to try to connect the artists uh, and their, their new community. Some of these artists might be from the neighborhood, others might come from outside moving here, um, but the, the need for connection with the community was, was very important. So I'm gonna end with a, a building that we completed in, in uh, the end of 2015. This is the Blue Barn Theater in Omaha, Nebraska here. Uh, the building is south of downtown, uh, across the railroad tracks, that separate the downtown from residential districts uh, to the south. So it's in a transitional area between light industrial, mixed use, and, and residential um, neighborhoods to the south. It's actually three projects in one. We have the, the Blue Barn Theater itself. We have a commercial development uh, mixed use building uh, called Boxcar 10, and then an outdoor community focused, uh, pri but privately owned public space. So this project, um, oscillates between issues of the neutrality of, of um, performance and gallery spaces. So this idea of the white cube, I mentioned this at the Bemis, is a, it's a term originated by Brian O'Doherty in a uh, 1976 article uh, where he succinctly traces the development of the ubiquitous modern form of the neutral white gallery from its roots in easel painting and the frame uh, to what we now understand as this sort of neutral white gallery that one sees in, in virtually every contemporary art space. But in the, uh, in the world of theater, the analog to this is the black box, um, which is in some ways the inverse, but the equivalent to the white cube. Uh, this is a, a, a common type mostly seen on uh, college campuses as experimental theaters, uh, but it originated from uh, a, in, in many ways, what is a misinterpretation of an argument by, by Peter Brook and, and Grotowski, uh, theater uh, innovators in the 50s, who started to argue that theater really doesn't require a grand hall, but it really just requires an actor, a text, and an audience in, in some form of space. So it could really occur anywhere. This was misunderstood by um, by many who got excited by these ideas, uh, it was misunderstood as a, as a call for neutrality, which wasn't really the in, original intention of, of Grotowski and Brook, um, but that resulted in this notion of the neutral uh, black space where uh, theater projects would be created out, out of nothing. Uh, Joshua Dax, our uh, theater consultant for this project, actually inspired um, our client to build the building. Uh, in the first place um, through an article he wrote critiquing this idea of neutrality, claiming that very similar to 
Brian O'Doherty, uh, that, that neutrality is anything but uh, uh, neutral in a sense that, um, you know, a black room is, uh, you know, loaded and, and ideological and, uh, and, and, and seriously uh, sort of uh, has implications for how we, we think of the shows uh, put on in those spaces. So we began the project by thinking about how we could create flexibility, the flexibility of, of the black uh, uh, you know, the, the black space, but the uh, neutrality um, was something we were trying to do away with. Um, so we thought of the project here as sort of the removal of uh, this void for the theater space to create this building, which is almost the exact um, uh, proportion of the theater of um, Box Car 10, which is a, a, a three-level apartment complex with a restaurant below. And then to surround concentrically the rest of the program around the theater space. So we've got uh, some some back of house space, then a, a ring of public area in blue, um, and then to form the building around the program and then this and the needs for for drainage. So the simplicity of the roof um, or the complexity of the roof, I should say, comes from the very simple need to have taller spaces in the theater uh, and to drain the roof to discrete points where we could control and uh, contain and collect uh, water runoff. We, um, for the, the open space, uh, actually chose to uh, run an international design competition rather than design it ourselves. And uh, ultimately with 50 entries, we pared that down to five working with a jury, uh, gave those five a stipend and uh, they developed their projects, their concepts, and then ultimately selected Eldorado and uh, El Dorado Architects uh, and Urban Rain Design as a, as a team uh, to develop uh, that space. Um, and what was interesting about their proposal was that they took our roof form and thought of that as a topography. So the continuity of roof and ground plane uh, became uh, really operative here and also a way to start to, to um, do some, some uh, demonstration projects for uh, sustainable urbanism in Omaha, which is not something we've seen much in the city collecting rainwater, using that for irrigation and so on. But for the theater itself, the really critical uh, innovation here is allowing the theater space to open up to the outdoor space. So when you see this black space of the theater, um, you could have that experience of the black, um, the black, uh, black box, but you also have the ability to open up to this sort of blue area to the west that we call the, the porch yard and then ultimately out to the outdoor space. Um, the roof over that originally we were imagining this to be a turf roof, which wasn't in the in the budget ultimately. Um, and then as you can see on the, the lower right the apartment plan uh, for one of those three levels uh, in box car ten. So this building built for a relatively low budget, um, about three million dollars for uh, construction uh, for a thirteen thousand square foot theater building. Um, so necessitated some some fairly uh, creative use of, of straightforward materials, um, working closely with the landscape designer there. But with the notion of a theater, uh, often what one experiences in theater buildings is blankness because there's a desire to separate the interior space from the city. We tried to uh, work against that with the, uh, this, the north elevation to create a, a, a kind of translucency and transparency in the building, but then a facade that had a, a sort of indeterminate depth um, and this uh, started us thinking about the, the way American buildings are typically made by uh, selections of predetermined building materials as, as products, um, you know, from uh, various suppliers and having those installed in, in warranted ways um, really takes the notion of fabrication and construction away from uh, the craftsperson and puts it in the hands of uh, the manufacturer off-site. And so we were trying to mix these these ways of thinking, more traditional ways of, of building on-site, and uh, uh, but also to maintain warranties with, uh, you know, building envelope details. So uh, with the Blue Barn Theater and part of its neighbor boxcar, we wrapped the base of the building with uh, a Corten steel cladding system with concealed fasteners. Um, but then clad, uh, overlaid that with overlaid that cladding with uh, a rebar screen made out of weldable rebar, it's suspended from a bracket at the top, uh, and attached at a couple of points along the building, and then backlit uh, with a light fixture. So at night, 
it starts to create a, a very interesting effect on, on this building. But then um, during the day, uh, certain times of the year, you get these wonderful shadows over the surface of the, the, the cladding system behind the rebar. And there are moments within the building where um, people can walk between the rebar and the building itself. Um, the rebar actually operates here as a guardrail. Um, but it also offers opportunities for artists to engage with the building itself. The Blue Barn wanted the building to, to live uh, and not to be a, 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 a sort of a, a, a static object, but something that would always be transformed. So the logo for the Blue Barn was welded onto the rebar screen uh, shortly after the uh, theater occupied the building. Uh, this was work of a, a local artist. But even during the construction process and the design process, we worked very closely with uh, artists who we commissioned uh, not to produce work that would be installed into in the building, but to actually to produce components of the building itself. Um, so many different artists have worked in the building over time, but four of them were actually commissioned during our design process and became part of our design team. Um, one of them is Michael Morgan, and he ended up producing uh, custom brick, custom fired bricks, um, which were installed at the vestibule and box office. Uh, all of the wood is salvaged by an artist named Dan Tober, including the large timbers, which he milled from trees that were felled during storms and other uh, other uh, occurrences in Omaha. Uh, Jim Woodfill made this light fixture. Um, obviously, it has some sort of inspiration from theatrical lighting, uh, but it's a permanent piece that could be manipulated uh, within the lobby, but also uh, provided a way to occupy the volume of the, of the building itself under the roof. Um, and then within the theater, again, Daniel Tober supplied the heavy timbers, uh, but even the, the wood cladding um, used for acoustical baffling on, on, and painted black here was salvaged from cutoffs from a hardwood timber company. Um, so the building itself uh, is um, really a cladding around this sort of very simple uh, set of program elements, the theater occupying the center. What's really critical here is the opening of all of these spaces to the landscape to try to make this as open as possible. And in this uh, series of um, this animation, you can see how the black box theater can actually be opened up, uh, expanded to the outside. We have fixed seating, which is not really a black box experience, but we can treat the stage as a black box or then move the theater to the outside uh, and use the porch yard, which is a covered space, or even out into uh, the green space beyond. So it allows the theater to, to have more traditional um, use of space, but also a much more experimental way of inhabiting the theater building itself. Um, the traditional theater here with the proscenium arch, sort of separating the stage and the, the seating in the house, rather than, than create uh, the sort of <clears throat> challenge to that typically in, in the black box, which is just a black room. Uh, we decided to expand the notion of framing to create multiple frames uh, that allow theater to happen within and between various different portions of uh, this experience, uh, this, this, this place of theatrical experience. Um, very important element to this is the large door. This was built by an artist named Chris Kemp. Um, uh, and one of the things that we found really interesting about this in, in the process of, of design and, and budgeting is that the, uh, the contractor, uh, Kiewit, believed that this door would cost about $120,000. It's about 12 feet tall and about 32 feet wide. Um, but we found an artist who originally told us he could do it for $12,000, but we were nervous that that was sort of under, he was undervaluing his time and, and uh, gave him a $25,000 budget. Um, which was uh, enough to allow him to do custom hinges uh, and weld and build the structure for these these very large doors that that operate really well and allow the theater to open up uh, either incrementally or entirely uh, to the outside so that performances can occupy uh, the interior space but then open up to the noise and um, unpredictable activities of the outside and let the city be a participant in the show itself. Uh, here we see an image of the back of that building um, as it opens up to the landscape. Um, but I want to conclude by just noting that this this project here is a sort of culmination of, of interest in bespoke design and also loose and improvisational uh, techniques of, uh, of, of resolving design and construction. Um, but it's also a new building that keeps the identity and the culture of the institution intact while also projecting its future and improving its technical capacity. 
and it asks the question, which form of craft is appropriate for this project, but answering that many, uh, many different forms of, of craft and, and ways of thinking about craft can overlap and play off one another to create frictions that cause both the regular user and the occasional patron to question their surroundings. So ultimately, it's not a question or a matter of which craft paradigm to choose, but how craftsmanship of various forms and levels of technological advancement with the selection of the correct tools merge in an ad hoc by situation, but situationally appropriate manner to meet the needs of the project. At some point in the process, computation, procedural modeling, algorithmic workflows, and digital fabrication need to be paired with non-computational techniques uh, as projects encounter exter external constraints such as sites and adjacent materials. So with that, uh, thank you very much. And um, if there are any questions, I will take those. Um, and I could shut down my share here if that helps. But. Jeffrey, thank you. That was really an absolutely amazing portfolio work. And um, I really enjoyed you taking us in depth um, in each project. I, I have a question for you because it seems that you do so much. You have a really mm -hmm. broad um, interest level and portfolio base. How do you manage your time and find balance between actual <laughs> architecture company and fact and all the work that you do at the university? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it is sort of two full-time or more than full-time jobs. and. Um, uh, yeah, it's, I don't know that I have a, a great answer for that, but it's, um, you know, I try not to let it be just a matter of putting out one fire after the next, but try to be a bit more strategic. Um, I mean, I think it helps that some of these projects are long-term, um, others like the Blue Barn Theater. I mean, that was, a, you know, despite the unconventional aspects of the project, I mean, it was a commissioned uh, project with a client who had a, a schedule and a budget and, and all of those fun things. So. Um, you know, that project was very intensive. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's, um, you know, my, my teaching schedule is, you know, it's fairly predictable in terms of when I need to be, you know, at the university. Um, but by trying to maintain um, maybe some similarities in what I'm thinking about intellectually between the teaching and the practice um, allows me to really kind of work on both at the same time. Um, but there's a lot of organization right now. My students um, were working in a sort of hybrid in-person online environment this semester, but I have uh, teams of students working with six different nonprofits to develop uh, different non uh, sort of affordable housing prototypes. Some of them will be built. Um, so I'm managing six different clients and then we're also going to be, you know, in installing all of that work in an exhibition next spring. So that's a tremendous amount of, of, of management. Um, and we just got hired to design three new houses for different clients in the last uh, few weeks. So the office is also getting very busy. So um, yeah, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but it's certainly a, <laughs> certainly a challenge. Absolutely. Well, how many people are in your firm? Uh, right now we have uh, myself and three others. Um, two of them are, are students, so they're part-time. Um, various degrees of, of engagement uh, with them. One of them is full-time we're trying to hire right now because of the new commissions we've recently received. Um, so um, yeah, we're, um, we're getting pretty busy again, which is not something I expected to happen this year given everything else that's going on. Right, right, well, that's wonderful. Um, okay, couple, a couple of other questions here. How do you connect with various craftspeople to understand what the capabilities are in order to produce the desired results? And how That's, do you assess yeah. when it's, well, it's two part? How do you assess when a craftsperson mm -hmm. is in over their heads? That is a great question, and um, I have, I think, early on we we learned the hard way that yes, a craftsperson can get over their head, and it's not necessarily the a craft ability. We had a a furniture maker we used to work with who ultimately um, couldn't complete a project which you know caused us a significant loss since we were sort of financially connected to his his work um, and it was mainly a matter of um, you know mismatched expectations he thought he, he was a very precise person but he didn't understand how to manage his business and ended up going bankrupt not just because of our project but we were sort of caught in the mix of his 
uh, his challenges as a as a business person. So I think one of the issues there is really understanding um, we we want to push fabricators to do their best work and to do things that are experimental for them, but to make sure that there's still an understanding of expectations, especially with you know commissioned projects for clients who have an expectation for a completed um, piece or, or building. Um, but it's it's it really comes from just understanding how craftspeople work or or fabricators work, knowing their tech their techniques. And I think the first project I showed the um, perforated wall panel in the in the residence in San Francisco is a good example. We we had an idea knowing what the capabilities of the technology are, what we wanted to build. Um, but once we started working with the fabricator and understanding um, the the challenges of the of machine time. Um, they were the ones who actually suggested that we optimize it for drilling as opposed to routing. Um, and at that point, we started to realize that the pushback from fabrication was really critical. And uh, so we try to engage fabricators as early as possible or artists, if that happens to be the case. So with the, the Bemis Low End project, um, we, we initiated that project with a, with a, a carpenter who's also an artist uh, and actually made him a sort of fixture of the design team from the very beginning. Um, so whenever we came up with, you know, crazy ideas like that plastered monolith piece, the pink thing in the middle of the performance space, he was right on. Um, in fact, he was the one who was sort of pushing it to be crazier and wackier than, than we even imagined. So uh, I think it's just a matter of it's really collaborating closely. And that's something that I've developed um, a, a, an ability to do by working with students to try to get the students to understand that they don't own, they don't have ownership over the whole project. They have sort of collective ownership, but not individual ownership and understanding that it's really about uh, conversation and, uh, and and working together and understanding that all this is something that won't be predicted. Excellent. Um, okay, this is a similar, similar realm. Jeff, uh -huh. given our shared context of mass production, can you envision a return to craft for the common architect? the common homeowner or the common builder who operate in a for-profit environment? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And I, I think, you know, you can kind of discount the student design build work by saying that, well, because students are doing it and they're doing it for academic credit, you know, they can afford to spend a lot of time trying to perfect something or resolve something that's, that's unique and individual. So it, you know, it, it doesn't translate immediately into, um, you know, the world of, of commissions and, uh, and and, and for-profit design work, but but when I talk about craft, I, um, you know, I I really do say, as I mentioned at the very beginning, that you know, craftsmanship it can exist in many contexts, including software and, and so on. So, in some ways, the the crafting uh, in in the way we build now has shifted to um, uh, you know the design craft in the computer. Um, and then that's connected to maybe more more conventional contemporary ways of building. But the Blue Barn Theater, I mean, that was built with a hard budget cap, um, with a, you know a contractor, Kiwit, which is you know Kiwit is they normally don't do anything under a hundred million dollars. So our building was tiny for them. Um, they're very good at managing, but they are not a, a contractor one would work with with anything that's custom because that's just the that cost their overhead is just tremendous when when uh, you start thinking about the effort to produce that so that's one of the reasons that uh, we treated the artists on that project as owners subcontractors so the owner in that case hired the the, the four artists uh, and then uh, after the project was over you know other artists but they they hired them directly um, and then Kiwit was was basically responsible for providing uh, substructures that were easily defined uh, in the scope of work. Um, and that's something that I think could occur in uh, in any type of project. Um, and, uh, you know, I think even in, in many commercial buildings, as long as there's a clear understanding of where one responsibility ends and the other begins, but by pulling them out of the general contract, we saved a lot of general conditions costs and, um, and, and and other overhead. So um, for the door, I mentioned that, you know originally Q it was going to price one hundred and twenty thousand dollars to build that custom door, um, but by taking that out of the general contract and treating it as an owner supplied item um, built by an artist um, who was you know paid fairly for his work by by all means, uh, we were able to achieve that level of precision and craft and, and attention to detail 
uh, within a budget that was, um, you know, quite challenging actually. So I think that idea is something that's translatable quite directly to um, to pretty much any kind of, of project. Absolutely. Okay, we've got a couple of questions related to your um, academic teachings. Sure. Can you state your position on the importance of practitioners bridging into the academic realm and vice versa, especially in cities the size of Omaha and Knoxville that both have schools of architecture and an abundance of practicing architects? And as a follow-up, um, would you suggest um, on how we can be more, for example, our city could be more engaged? Uh, again, those are those are great questions. We, um, you know, my university prides itself on having a really tight relationship with um, alumni and practitioners. Uh, you know, um, Omaha is somewhat unique in that we have three very large firms based here. Um, so HDR, which is I don't know, they were very high up in the sort of billings rank this year, um, is headquartered here. Leo Daly's headquartered here, and DLR started here, but technically isn't headquartered here anymore. So there are uh, a lot of practitioners um, in in the city, and we have a close relationship with them. That the, the the heads of some of those companies are are graduates of our program, and um, so um, maintaining that relationship is really important. We don't see our school as being a sort of uh, at, at all removed from the profession. We do things that maybe the the professionals and the question sometimes you know in the studios but we we maintain a really close connection so we have sponsored studios where uh firms um sponsor the studio and there's different ways that can happen it could be financial sponsorship it could be um you know letting a staff member co-teach a studio with a faculty member um but the staff member's time is covered um by by the firm um, and sometimes that happens. Um, I mean, usually those ha those occur around areas of mutual interest. So, you know, DLR, uh, which is a you know large firm that does a lot of um, of educational projects, sponsored a studio that looked at at um, you know uh, secondary school um, design and construction, and um, you know contributed staff and and even consultants to that project. So I think there's there's a, a way for these bridges to happen. I mean, I do it sort of on my own terms because I'm a practicing architect and a uh, and an academic so in that sense i'm kind of internally kind of bridging that that gap but it happens a lot um you know in in other fashions i mean the simplest thing is just to be available for you know practitioners to be available as design critics um to uh you know talk to students and faculty uh in reviews um but we've also uh, when i was director of the architecture program at unl um, I hired a number of uh, adjunct faculty from the profession who were fully engaged in the profession, but hired them to teach things like professional practice, the professional practice course, or our computation courses, and so on. We're taught by people who are fully engaged in in practice, um, whereas you know, obviously, architectural history is taught by trained historians, and so on. So um, yeah, I think that those those bridging moments are really critical, um, and I I would hope that it's seen as a two way uh, sort of connection where the the school is benefiting from the um, hearing from the profession, but the professionals are hearing maybe new ways of thinking about architecture or um, keeping their sort of critical faculties alive, um, despite the fact that you know they may be very busy in the sort of practical world of, of running an office. Absolutely, I think that Knoxville and it sounds like Omaha have this this uh, ability to mm -hmm. have a great relationship between the two the two realms and um, I know that we have a lot of people in our in our city that are very interested in that and we're mm -hmm. still finding those common threads to, mm -hmm. to knit the two together. Mm -hmm. um, so a question for you relative to the students that are that are working in the design design build world and I'm specifically mm -hmm. thinking about the the faceted panel project where you had mm -hmm. students engaging with craftsmen that happen to be inmates. Mm -hmm. um, do you see long-term benefit? Do you, you know, do you have students come back to you and say, "Listen, I really, I, that was really meaningful for me to have that interaction with craftsmen because it possibly led me to be a better communicator with in the in a more traditional construction field with a contractor or mm -hmm. um, or an artist or a craftsman." Do you get some of that feedback? Yeah, I, I think um, you know one of the things that I try to to teach um, is 
you know, really to help students understand if they have some ideal, something that they want to produce, um, that there's a way to make that happen. And that what they need to do is find the right people. And, um, and, and often that means working, um, you know, outside of the norm of, of the way buildings are produced. So, yeah, you can go to a company like Dry Design and get, you know, all sorts of cladding, you know, uh, systems for a building, but, um, but you're going to end up with something that's somewhat standardized and conventional. But if you, you know, think about um, different ways of producing things, I, I think um, the Design Build Studio helps students understand how to sort of exert creativity in, uh, in the sort of, uh, far end of the design process when things are actually being built, which, you know, I, I, I argue a lot with um, academics who, uh, you know, question why, why we're doing design build because architects are never going to build things. And it's not about the students learning how to pour concrete. It's about them knowing how to talk to the concrete person who's going to pour the concrete and knowing what you're going to get out of that. And typically in an arch in, in architecture school, most design um, experience of students in the studio are really schematic design. I mean, they never get beyond that. Um, and so what I do in these projects in the, the info shop project with the, the perforated panels is a good example of that. That was a situation where my firm actually did schematic design for that project. And I began the semester by presenting the design to the students. And their goal or their charge was really to take uh, schematic ideas and to sort of work through design development and construction documents as we needed them uh, and fabrication to really sort of focus the their creative energies on that sort of latter part of the process uh, not necessarily the conceptual end of it um, uh, obviously they had to understand where the project came from and what the ideas were but the ter determining how that worked the the relationship with the prison was sort of a very unique collaboration. The prison actually approached us at one point because uh, most of the inmates in this program were building, you know, pretty conventional furniture for state office buildings and schools, and they wanted to do more complex things to to give them some more unique skills. And um, this project came along, and it felt like a good match. So we we made a partnership with the with the inmate, with not the inmates, but with the the, the entity that operates the the, the prison shops and um, and found that as a, a really interesting way to you know, both engage students with you know, people that they're not used to working with. Um, that we actually did tour the in the prison, which was eye opening for a lot of students. Um, but uh, don't want to ramble on here, but I think that this um, you know these unconventional partnerships are often the way to produce unique projects, and and that's one of the things I want students to understand is they they can go outside of the standard set of, of suppliers and fabricators on a, pro, on a typical architectural project um, to find other ways of, of getting results. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, last question here. Do you self-perform any construction work in the full-scale professional projects that do not involve student design build work? Yes, so uh, the the, the the flock project um, that was built by our office. There was no um, we had a student intern, but he was a paid employee of the office. Um, so that was not a for a for credit opportunity for students, but it was a self performed project um, built you know for an art gallery and ultimately you know installed permanently at another art center. Um, we haven't done ground up buildings that way. Um, I, I I have some friends in practice who have you know sort of experimented with um, large-scale design build within their firm and they've, they've found that it, it just is it's very challenging both from a financial and, and a management uh, position so it's not something that I'm particularly interested in doing on a large scale um, you know outside of interior projects and furnishings um, I'd rather form partnerships with builders to do, or, or maybe unconventional builders to, to do things that uh, are, are more unique. Excellent. And I guess okay. the last thing I should say just about the student involvement here is that, you know, one of the sort of ethical issues that we, we occasionally bump up against is, you know, are students doing free work for, you know, a client who is, you know, getting away without paying? And, um, so we only work with nonprofit organizations when the students are involved as 
in, in that uh, poor credit opportunity. But what has to be really understood by everybody who's involved in a particular project is that the goal is to provide an educational experience first from our point of view, and um, but also to serve a community or, or a nonprofit. But it always has to be an educational experience for, for the students. 